everyone, and welcome to a, a scholarly, academic, and Halo-filled episode of um, Words, Images, and Worlds. Halo being the effect that Dr. Francisco Torres currently has uh, going on. I think the the beauty of academia and the intelligence is just it's shining through. I, I don't want Halo to be confused with the video game, although we can talk about that. I've only played one or two uh, versions of Halo, but... Um, yeah, yeah, Dr. Torres, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. I know that we have connected across a couple of spaces. As you were saying before I started the recording, we have mutual friends. Uh, you and I work together from a distance. Publishing anywhere, anytime is always from a distance, I think. But we work together on a piece for uh, an issue of Study and Scrutiny that I was editing. And you co-wrote that with David Lowe, who was on uh, a few episodes back. Um, so anything that you'd like to, to say about what drew you to this world of comics and visual literacy and even academia? Oddly enough, I think... Uh... First academia, I can say that I never thought I'd be in academia. Uh, most of it was serendipity uh, because I just didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. But I knew I wanted to do something justice oriented. I knew I wanted to have an effect somewhere. And uh, it just happened to be schools. It happened to be me thinking about, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I like to tell people it's not the rich part of Connecticut. Uh, it is the poor part of Connecticut. And I always thought our schools were under-resourced, so that we didn't have enough of anything. Uh, so I wanted to do something there. And I just happened to get into academia and thinking about education and thinking about social justice and equity from that point. I will admit that I'm not a, I was never a teacher. So I never got my certification in teaching, but I've spent many years now working in schools with teachers uh, to try to bring comics work and social justice into these spaces. Just has its benefits and uh, backdrops of not being a teacher, but I think it's been a great experience. And as for comics, I actually started my master's. I got my master's degree in English education, uh, English, well, English for education um, in Puerto Rico. And I actually did it with fairy tales then. Uh -huh. Somehow fairy tales led me to OSU. I was there for one year. I worked with uh, Dr. Pat and CISO and we did a superhero project during the summer just something we came up together. This is the first time she did superheroes and now she's really into that work. Um, and I did superheroes with her and I just continued. I moved to CU Boulder because my wife's uh, mentor was headhunted there. <laughs> and uh, somehow she negotiated for both of us to go to CU Boulder. And then I just continued the comic book work. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. It sounds like our, our stories are not exact parallels, but there are definitely overlaps because I never saw myself in academia either. Uh, first generation PhD, first generation academic. Um, no one else in my immediate family even taught that I can think of. And so that, that creates its own sort of imposter syndrome and all of those pieces that come with it. But there's also a joy in, in getting to share a little bit of that. And then I do, I actually love that you come alongside teachers, even though um, you're saying you've not been in the classroom as a teacher necessarily as your um, preparation for this work you're doing. Uh, educators do need folks that can come alongside as, as mm -hmm. advocates. There's certainly enough folks that, that come along as critics, I feel. Yes. Um, and a lot of that comes in the political arenas and um, amateur social media marksmen and stuff like that but um, it's really great to have a network of support and especially at the university level to have that support for what you're doing in the classroom and to have people talking to you about your practices yeah it's, I think it's one of the nice things is just, like since I was never a certified teacher and I was never in a classroom in that way uh I don't have the same constraints, mental constraints of thinking, how would I fit this into a lesson plan or how right. do I match it to standards? Those aren't things I'm typically thinking about. I think about them once I go work with a teacher, uh, but I get to experiment a little bit more, not knowing or not maybe being a little naive in that sense. Uh, but then also, I think one of the things academics are really bad at is centering the teacher's knowledge when we get into their classroom. 
and saying they're the experts. And luckily, since I wasn't a teacher, I have to do that because they are the experts and I'm not of that space. Uh, so it really helps keep that balance. And I've had great collaborations with teachers, librarians to do this work. Can't do it without them. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a community. It's a literacy community. Yes. Um, and I love that connection of fairy tales to comics because that immediately, immediately makes me think about Charles Vess and immediately makes me think about Neil Gaiman and um, the magic fish uh, Trung Lee Win and all of those pieces. And it's, it's just really nice to think about comics as not simply one thing, because I know mythology was something that in my mind overlapped as a young reader. Oh, yeah. And so thinking about those, those fairy stories as a way of also thinking about these mythic tales, uh, it's really, they exist in this, again, I'm using the word network a lot here, but this network of like texts and literacies. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was never a, so I never read <clears throat> US based comics. That, that was not my thing. Although I use it now in my research a lot, only because I find the connection of pop culture, because their movies are everywhere. So I like leveraging what students know about some of the movies and stories to then talk about comics, superheroes of color specifically, and then have them create their own stories. But I am was always a manga reader. I love reading manga. I grew up on manga whether it be One Piece, Naruto, Bleach, some of these other ones that are more famous. I loved reading manga all my life, but I never considered that reading. So that's also an aspect of the work, which was uh, me coming into my own saying, I was a reader. I just happened to read these texts that weren't a part of the uh, normal curriculum, quote unquote, um, but that, that mattered. So even now, even though I'm doing U.S.-based comics primarily with students, uh, I don't call myself a comic book expert or anything so of that sort. So I'm not, for example, like David Lowe, uh, he knows his comics. <laughs> I don't know my comics. I know my manga. I could talk for days about manga. Uh, but uh, it's just interesting how that collided uh, in my life and how I finally got into this world where I was dealing with some of the genre that I really enjoyed. Uh, and I think um, you bring something really powerful and um, thoughtful about it all because uh, like David Lowe, I'm a longtime reader and I connected with, you mentioned those media connections with film and popular culture. I mean, that's what connected me with DC Comics initially. And then throughout the 90s, I read uh, whatever was sort of published, popular and available in a small town. And to look back, you know, I can see some of those pop culture connections from the 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. Uh, thinking about an issue of She-Hulk where it basically looks like a superhero version of like an 80s movie, like Working Girl, a superhero version. Um, on the other hand, I've really had to dig back into manga. Um, I think I would have loved it as a young reader. It just simply wasn't available. I mean, I had Fist of the North Star. That was the closest thing to manga that I experienced as a young reader. So, so to have folks whose reading lives touch on things that I've not read uh, is really, it, it brings a lot to the story, I feel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, kids are always, <clears throat> even the comic book kids, there's also those who know the superhero stories but then also start bringing in like one punch man from the animes and stuff like that mm -hmm. so they're, they're kids much like we are drawing and i'll use the word networks as well uh from their repertoires from their networks what they know and bringing them into the stories they want to tell so i love being able to be able to bridge some of that i can't always bridge everything they are the experts in some of these things as compared to i uh, and then other times I could tell them, yeah, that's One Punch Man. They're impressed. Like, you know One Punch Man? It's like, yeah, I, I know One Punch Man. It's hard to, to miss the bald-headed guy that it just destroys everything with One Punch. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. There, there's nothing like One Punch Man. And uh, some of these stories, I mean, Attack on Titan has gained oh popularity. That is, uh, that, so the anime is beautiful, but the manga, well, the anime is just as dark, but it's just so good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Really good. And it is epic. It is sweeping. You see the development of the author and artist throughout that book. Yes. Uh, just so full of 
fantasy, fairy tale mythology. It's all infused there. And as you said, also dark and uh, violent and goes, it goes to that edge that I feel like young adult readers really crave as well. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So I want to also, I want to hat tip a few things, which is where you are and what you're doing right now. I want to give you the, the chance to talk about that as well as um, the work that you're doing in cultural literacies, because I know comics are part of your work, but having uh, surveyed your Vita and, and done a look across the things that you've published, um, do you, would you like to say anything about that aspect of your work and how it informs your uh, interactions with pre-service teachers, in-service teachers? So yeah, I think, um, so my work is quite broad, I feel. Although right now, as you know, as academics, we know we have to sell it as a, <laughs> there's a thread and my thread is social <laughs> justice and equity. Uh, but it, I do a lot of things. So for comics, a lot of the work I've been doing for the past few years are all about identity, mostly not really about identity. I'm, I'm saying that now, but uh, I think a lot of the aspects that people have been drawn to with my work is how I get kids to center who they are in the stories against some social justice issue in their communities. And I don't, I try not to allow them to become someone else. Uh, I want them to be themselves, even if when they get powers, they might change a little to fight some injustice, because I want them to care about their community and fight against something. So that's been that uh, caveat of work. I've also been trying to work with pre-service teachers to think about critical dispositions they can take on. There's a paper I'm trying to work on right now with a lot of data I've been collecting over here at Kent State, uh, related to a course I teach, it's called Topics in Social Justice and Equity in Education. So it's secondary pre-service teachers who are going into our program, so they're not even on our program yet. They're required to take this course before they enter, and just trying to get them to think about what are the critical dispositions uh, a teacher should have when they come into the field. And for that work, I'm centering a lot of revolutionary love uh, in that sense, because I want them, basically I tell them that I couldn't care at all whether you use the term social justice and equity. What I want you to think about is if you truly love the, your students and you want to love your students, what does that entail? Well, that entails knowing about sexism, xenophobia, racism, uh, X, Y, and Z things and addressing those in your space. Because if you don't, then you're not really loving your students. It's the actions that matter. So I go mm -hmm. with that route. And I think another thing I'm probably known for is the decolonial work that I've been doing with Carmen Medina, uh, Dr. Carmen Medina, Indiana State, that uh, we've been working, trying to work with decolonial theories and children's literature from Puerto Rico. Uh, and just looking how these texts can help decolonize spaces. So I think uh, a lot of people tend to nod their heads to talk and yang argument that if it's not land or land acknowledgement or land uh, reclamation that it's not really decolonial and we push back a little bit about on that because Puerto Rico Puerto Ricans are primarily still on their land and we're highlighting that before you even get to land uh, reclamation you need to get to mental decolonization uh, to imaginative decolonization so I've been doing a lot of work with that thinking about decoloniality thinking about setting up spaces that are a bit more um indigenous, a bit more culturally aware. Uh, and I think those are some of the big threads that I've been having with my work recently. And I, when you mentioned Puerto Rico and decolonization, one of the things that I think about, one of the first people I think about is uh, Sonia Nieto and, and the work that she's done. I had the chance to hear her right before the pandemic in 2019 at the Literacy Research Association Conference, which is not my favorite conference, by the way. Um, I won't edit that out. I'll just put that out there. But, you know, I, I appreciate what they do. Um, I And I just remember being so struck by the way that she talked about growing up as a Spanish-speaking student in um, North American schools and how... Spanish was not allowed and how those aspects of identity and culture were pushed to the side. And uh, it was one of those things that continues to resonate with me. And when I have students who are bilingual, multilingual, I always encourage them to compose and share across languages. And, and I'm, I'm an English speaker. I know a little bit of high school Spanish and I 
also took New Testament Greek once upon a time because I have a background in religion, which is not helpful at all, by the way, except grammatically because no one speaks it anymore. Um, <laughs> but but it helps me think about um, language. And, and as a teacher, as a as a person who wants to engage in that work, I, I'm willing to do the translation and kind of fuss through those things and, and feel out the connections in language. And there's such a beauty to that. And the other thing I remember from Sonia Nieto's uh, work and presentation was just talking about that validation as a scholar. Uh, I remember, and I wrote down, she talked about walking in with a sense of power because I feel like academia uh, and a lot of spaces do that. They center power in really limited ways, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. And to, to walk in with the knowledge that I do belong here. This mm -hmm. is a space for me to share and to be part of the conversation. It's, it's something I continue to think about. Yeah, I mean, I was also there when she gave that speech. Uh, and I think that was in Tampa. I'm not yes, the biggest fan of LRA, so I had to, uh, I'll, add, I'll add to your echo. <laughs> uh, but uh, I remember that speech and thinking, well, I'm Puerto Rican myself. This is one of the premier Puerto Rican scholars in our field finally getting a chance to say something about her work on the, the big literacy stage. And I felt proud because there aren't many Puerto Ricans in education at those levels. I think Cameron Martinez Roldan is one of them, um, of course, Cameron Medina, um, but there aren't a lot of us. And it's just, it's always a proud moment when we get to see uh, a few of our people really succeeding in academia because it is a very colonizing space. It's very different than Puerto Rico. Uh, if you were able to teach there. And um, so it's always good to be in that space. And language is part of my work. So I also, with my comics, get students to whatever language you speak at home, I want to see it in the comic. It has to be who you are. If it's not who you are, why are you telling this story? Absolutely. And and I also want to, I mentioned Sonia Nieto there, but I want to um, just mention that I resonate so strongly with your work as well. And I'll, I'll link a couple of representative examples. In fact, you can send me a, a couple of things that you'd like me to link when I share this, um, because I feel like there are a lot of words for equity and there are a lot of words for social justice and, and folks know the words. And sometimes the words change and people that are really invested will change with the words. But uh, I think you've actually, you've, absolutely hit on something there between the words and practice because i feel like a lot of a lot of places have diversity statements a lot of places have commitments to diversity but the the proof is in the action i think and that's where i try to go it i can't do it at a at an institutional level but it, within a classroom or within my interactions or within you know an office space i can have those reflections and conversations where I think about, okay, am I being performative here? Um, or am I really trying to think through this? And, and that that mention of loving and care as part of what makes a classroom work is, is just so powerful. So I want to, I want to thank you for that work as well. I appreciate that. I mean, I'm very happy and lucky that even with my, the first piece I published, I got to publish it with the ideas I cared about at the time which was about an after-school program and trying to fight against Trumpism uh, at that time. Um, and luckily, I think uh, I've continued doing that work, uh, fighting against authoritarianism and xenophobia and racism, linguistic racism, et cetera, in the spaces that I get into because it matters to the kids that are there, but also matters to me as a Puerto Rican, as matters to me as a father of a Puerto Rican daughter. Um, and there's just so much work to be done. And I think I am lucky that I have been able to continue doing it primarily because I think because of the networks I have, uh, but I can, it's easy to see many academics who try to do this work, who get uh, entangled in the ivory tower hmm. uh, and then sort of lose that joy or hope that they had in the beginning about what social justice and equity meant. And I'm hoping, I'm, I think it's a fight to keep it that Keep that at its core in uh, academia. Absolutely. Absolutely. For educators that are out there that um, are listening, are there particular resources, both in terms of comics, but also in terms of um, scholarship or um, 
voices that can speak to teacher preparation that mm -hmm. you would want to share? Not to put you on the spot, but just anything that, that bubbles to the surface. Yeah, so I will mention to those out there that I am the worst at name dropping. So I'm not that kind of academic. <laughs> I'm not the I'm not very good at remembering names, but there are a few people that I always go to to read that have made me feel more fulfilled or have made me think about teaching in very profound ways. And maybe I can give you those. Uh, one of them is Yolanda Sili Ruiz's work on racial yeah. literacy. Uh, right now, she's doing archaeology to self work, and I've been using that with. Uh, pre-service teachers and faculty members to get them to think about doing uh, uh, thinking about race and class and gender and other things. Uh, so those that work has really helped me and pushed me forward. Besides the fact that Yolanda Celia Ruiz not only writes these things but also enacts them, she is a light. Uh, so I always appreciate her work. Uh, Dr. Bell Hooks' uh -huh. work. Uh, I always go back to. Uh, Teaching to Transgress. It's one of her classic books, of course, uh, but I always think about the splitting of the mind, body, and soul that she talks about in that text and how my work is trying to get that splitting and put it back together through the theories I use, whether it be translanguaging, affect, critical theories of race, all these components that could make up the mind, body, and soul, uh, theoretically. Um, so that's another person. Uh, Dr. Cornell West, I tend to listen to a lot. Um, mostly because I just feel like I was raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I got to go to a Baptist church quite a few times when my friends invited me. I'm not Baptist. I'm Pentecostal on some level. I say on some level because I have my issues with religious people, not necessarily, not all religious people, but some religious people who use the doctrine to um, uh, hate rather than love. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, Dr. Cornell West always brings a prophetic voice to the th work he's doing. And I always feel like there's something there when I'm listening to him that's pushing me forward uh, that others can find helpful. And it's also funny to hear Dr. Cornell West and Dr. Bell Hooks talk to each other because uh, <laughs> they had such an interesting relationship, those two in videos. And I think uh, just my mentors, uh, some people that I have, really grown up with, who have taught me, Dr. Elizabeth Dutro, when it comes to affect and love and spaces, Dr. Uh, Patricia Enciso, uh, when it comes to imagination, uh, when it comes to play and spaces, uh, those are all aspects I think I take into account a lot when I'm writing about comics, thinking about classroom spaces, how can it be more playful, how can it be more fun, yet very academic, because playing is academic. And uh, is there anyone else? Uh, and the person that got me on, one of the people that got me on this journey was Dr. David Lowe. Uh -huh, I can't uh -huh. go without mentioning him. He was on my dissertation committee, but he was also one of the first pieces I read around comics that dealt with race and thinking about the impact of race in a classroom space through comics. And I thought that was amazing. So I think I can't get away from... Uh, just some of those origin story, my origin story is academic, some of those people, but also thinking about some of those bigger names that have really pushed my work forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, there's so many resources, resources out there for teachers to think about. I jotted down the the archaeology of self because I'd like to dig into that. Uh, any of the, the comics creators, comic spaces that you want to mention for folks that want to consider uh, building some lessons and ideas around a few creative works. Yeah, I think um, the one big space that I always used, especially at the beginning, and I don't use as much now, but I found very useful because they had free resources and stuff was Pop Culture Classroom. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so I use them a lot. I continue using them a lot. And although they don't necessarily name themselves as a social justice and equity classroom thing, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stories they're telling are unheard stories uh, of struggle. So I really appreciate th that space. Uh, and I think that's the main resource I used uh, for that work. Uh, when I was first beginning thinking about what comics can I bring into spaces, which ones can I find that are free? Mm -hmm. That's uh, always helpful. <laughs> yes. Uh, as it relates to comic books, so I can't name authors, and I think I'm going to mess up titles as well. But I really liked uh, some of the new uh, Black Captain America, not Steve Rogers. Mm -hmm. Sam Wilson. Mm -hmm. Sam Wilson's Captain America. 
Black Panther, of course. Uh, right. Miles Morales. Uh, I love Miles Morales. Though the, the one caveat I'll give the teachers is that Miles Morales, the writers of Miles Morales are really good at bringing in his uh, black, his blackness, but not so good at bringing in his Puerto Ricanness. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's ever been a Latino actually writing the Miles Morales comic. Uh, or an Afro Latino writing the Miles Morales comic, so I think that tends to, you know, it falls to the wayside a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a caveat that I tend to bring to people. Although I made, I've had students watch the movie and parts of it just for them to start seeing little images and language. Uh, yeah. They love that movie; it's a really good one. Um, and then, the Green Lantern Legacy was another book that I've really enjoyed reading recently. Uh, just because thinking about grandmothers as strength and family as strength. Uh, so those are some of the things that I've been reading, I think, that have been super helpful to thinking, not just about pedagogy, but just stories that led me to think about how can I engage students in critical thinking and critical conversations on some topics. Absolutely. And Men Lay is worth reading anytime. Um, I actually used the Sam Wilson Captain America, the first uh, sort of run of that just recently with some students to think about reading the image and reading carefully and critically and closely. Um, and I'll say there's a final sort of overlap as we're getting to the end of our, our episode time together, which is that I was also raised going to Baptist churches, uh, attended Pentecostal churches, actually was um, licensed in a Pentecostal church for a little while, and currently thinking through and uh, processing some of those same experiences of disconnect between the ways uh, a message of love and community can be used to foster division. So uh, you and I also have that in common as a, as a part of our uh, intersections of identity and exploration. So just, just kind of a cool connect there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm like, I teach... I told you, I teach my topic social justice equity course. I live in a very conservative state, Ohio. Ohio is trying to pass many bans on any DEI work and things of that sort. But I'm always having these conversations with students and religion does come up because it's also, there's a lot of, a huge religious population here. And I think it's one thing that I try to bring in, not to try to create controversy, but rather to say, depending on the preacher, the your evaluation of the text is going to change the text mm -hmm. being Paul in this case. And then depending on the language, uh, depending on how far back you want to go, uh, you might say, for example, what was God's name in some of the original texts or how um, um, Aramaic, and then you're like, it's a law. And then people are like, wait a minute, isn't that what the Muslims call an Islam God, Allah? It's like, yeah, they're the same. There's language there and you can play with language and you find... Uh, priests and preachers who have been doing a lot of research here, or you can find people that are trying to promote some kind of love, no matter what uh, happens or what people are articulating politically. Uh, so it's something I struggle with, and I think I've brought in a little into my work, not necessarily with comics, but I also make sure to mention to students when they're creating their comics, I want them to be their full self. So if you're religious mm -hmm. and you have a cross at your house, put it in the comic. Because I think when I make up comics, I have them do it in three parts. So for teachers, they might like this. I do a beginning, middle, and the end. The beginning, it has to be the story of them. Give me a snapshot of your life. Give me a snapshot of who you are. I need to see your languages and stuff like that. The middle is some, somewhat of like, how did you get your powers? And then start introducing the villain. Why are they important? And the last part is that sort of climactic battle scene. Like, how are you going to face off them? Of, off against this villain. I always give them the option of uh, finding the villain as a group, of discussing how just fighting the villain isn't enough to stop the injustice. But, you know, they're kids and typically always choose just to fight the villain, <laughs> beat right. them to a pulp, and then uh, send them to jail, and then it's done. But I tend to end, because I think one of the things academics are really bad at doing too sometimes is uh, twisting the words of students Uh so I always add, try to end their comics and say, so what's the final message you would want your readers to get away? I think a final message is kind of, maybe it goes back to my fairy tale days, actually, where there was a point to where you had a moral of the story sort of at the end of some of these stories. 
Um, but I try to ask them to give me what's the moral. Sometimes it's end gun violence, stop killing black people. Um, but that way they have the final say on what their piece is supposed to symbolize. And I think that's also part of the ethic I'm trying to bring into my educational space with them. Uh, that is that is awesome work, awesome work. And uh, I love how you're inviting students to share their full selves. I think that's always, um, that, that should always be our practice of embracing, loving, and caring for students. And I just appreciate that. I know you mentioned uh, a thread or a through line to your work. Sometimes I want that just to be what I happen to be interested in at the moment. But I love that um, student-centered and compassion-based approach to what you do. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I can't, I am only an academic because they were willing to be a part of my projects. <laughs> Uh, so if I'm not centering who they are, or at least pushing them to say that their lives matter, pushing them to say that their languages and voices matter in these spaces, then I don't feel like I'm doing the work I should be doing. Uh, students deserve to be heard, to be, deserve to be seen. And if they aren't in other spaces, they could be, at least in my spaces, the spaces I create in schools. Uh, so I really try to push for that, even if it at times conflicts with what they want to do as a superhero. They were what well, they want to turn into a beast or be a teenager if they're not if they're little kids. I'm like, no, be a kid. It's OK to be a kid. It's wonderful to be a kid. Your powers can make you grow a little bigger like the Hulk. Uh, they can make you smash things. That's fine. But you're still a kid at the heart of the comic. And I want that to come through. I don't want you to pretend that your power is only when you get bigger. Uh, I don't want you to, I don't want you to see that who you are, who your value, it only increases with the number of years you add to your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like there's so much of my work is really about making sure students feel valued and then making sure that they feel that they, they can do something to change their circumstances, their events around them. Of course, systemically, I think about systems and I think about oppression in that way, but at least to make them feel that if there's gun violence, what can they do to fight that? How can they use their voices? Because their voices do matter. I, I can't think of a better final word for the episode. So I'm just going to say uh, hashtag, amen, retweet, whatever it happens to be. And uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. And I hope to talk with you again for another episode to talk about a, an ongoing project that you're working on. Thank you so much, Jason. I really appreciate it. Thank you.